Hello, I'm Mark Bremer. In this tutorial for Carrera 7 for 3D World Magazine, we're going to look at how you create the lighting for this scene that's included on the disc with it. Let's look at a couple factors and then we're going to get the file, the starter file, prepared for lighting and I'll show you some of the places to look. We've got your basic spotlights like all 3D programs have. However, what we're going to look at are some unique ways to create these light cones using inverted shadows. So the light can actually reside behind objects, yet have the light rays emanate from them. We'll look at special effects, like the kind where we get this little spark between these two energy types of balls. Some specialty shape lights, which create a ring light around this top area. Tubular lights, which create the wall details and reflected ceiling light. And finally, some shape lights also that occur right here on the bottom. As a very last step, we will begin applying some textures, but this is not a texturing tutorial. The full textures and materials used to create the scene are available with it, but I won't be spending much time with those or how to build those things out. So let's go ahead and close this window. The scene that we're going to take a look at and start with, the one you open up, is the one I have as the Carrera starter scene. It will render up as a grayscale like this, and I want to show you how we're going to reset this to have no lights in the scene, and then start adding lights in so we can see the effects of them as we work. So with step one here, let's go ahead and prepare the scene for lighting. As you open the file, it should in theory pop open in four views. If it does not, come up to the icons in the very top corner over here and go to the four view option, giving you the maximum ability to locate things in 3D space well. Also very important is going to be this white box showing up here. This happens to be the area that is rendered inside the camera. To view that, you can come to the view menu and show production frame. There's two production frames, so be cautious here. One is to just have the production frame, which has specific values for it, and the other one is to show it right here. We're interested in showing the production frame. Finally, as we get ready to go here in this scene, we've got some dark areas, and it's just hard because some of the lights are going to be behind objects, inside of objects. So the best thing for us to do is going to be to actually turn these three other frames into wireframes very easy to do in Carrera. In this top view with it selected, there's a light yellow line around that now. I'll come over here to my viewing controls for the windows right here, over to wireframe, and click wire. Likewise, I'll just click off the objects in these two other views, and now we're ready to go with a wireframe presentation. I do have some default lights set in here, and let me show you where those are. On the right side is the properties palette. I'll go ahead and click on that little button, then it flies out. I've got my station in one group. I've got the planet outside the window in another group, which is really just a billboard with a texture map on it. And then I've got my lights in a group right here. You'll see I've got a couple items already in there. Light, ceiling, edge. That's actually just the reflector. There's no bulb in there yet, and we'll handle that later. The lights that actually render the scene up right here are the director's lights. Instead of selecting them individually, I'm going to select the group that they're in and come up to visibility and turn that off. Checking the visibility box at the top not only hides it in the 3D view, but prevents it from rendering in the final render. There is an in-between option, and if we come to station and disclose that, you'll notice that there is low ceiling that looks like it's grayed out. And it's grayed out because, when I click on it, it's still visible for the render, but I have disabled the show object in 3D view, which gets it out of our way so that we can work more conveniently with the lights. Finally, we're going to go to the render room and come over here and click on the film strip, which takes us into the render room. The contents of the property palette have now changed. Down about midway, we have something called global illumination. The first option is skylight. The final full color, full texture render does not use skylight at all. However, it's engaged for the purposes of showing the clay render. I'll disable that. For the final textured render, we do use indirect lighting at 150% intensity. So we will turn this back on for our final render, but in the meantime, we're going to disable this to accelerate our render right now. If we go back into our assembly room, clicking on the hand, we'll now be able to do a render of the scene there's a keyboard shortcut, Command or Control R, depending whether you're on the PC or not. And we also have an area render tool we can use here, keyboard shortcut X. I'll just click and drag. 
and we should see a lot of black inkiness, not much to it at all. All that shows up is the little bit of steam we have rising because this particular element does not interact with light. It will cast shadows, but is not darker or lighter depending on light in the scene. So our scene is set up right now and we're ready to go ahead and begin working with the initial lights in step two. As we begin step two, we'll put our first unique light in to begin illuminating the scene, and that will be a shape light. Come up to the insert menu and scroll on down to, it's not wanting to let me scroll, there we go. We'll choose shape light here down in the lights area and click OK. That pops into our scene and let me collapse our station group here so that we have a little easier way to work with and we're going to rename this bulb ring for the ring light that it'll be. Like all good 3D artists we, we keep a very tight control over our naming conventions, right? So we've got bulb ring. We can see where it pops into the scene because we've got these little control widgets on it. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll here. I'm using the option alt and right click to drag through my scene right here. But all the camera controls are here on the left if you want to move around on any given viewport. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This ring light, we're going to want to reside near these little energy orbs that we see in our scene. So I'm going to just visually line this up real quickly. And from the side view here, Pull this up. Now you'll notice that the widget itself has a little black dot in the center. This is called the hot point in Carrera. It's the axis of rotation coming from some other 3D software. It's where everything rotates around or scales to. It is also with light bulbs where the light actually emanates from. Now this is a huge bulb. We don't need to make it that large. So I'm going to come up to the motion tab and change this from 100% to 10%. This does not in any way affect the brightness of the light or anything. It's just scaling it in your scene to make it a little easier to work with. I'll come back to the Generals tab at the top. Let's adjust some of the custom settings right now. And one of the first things I want to do is grab this bulb ring light and actually pull it into our light group. So it shows up down here at the bottom. The brightness will leave at 100% for right now, but I want to be a cool blue type of light. So I'm going to click on the color box and simply choose a lighter blue type of color. The exact metrics for it aren't important. Additionally, if you want, there's a little disclosure triangle to fly out and you can go ahead and just color pick right from the list right there if that's an easier way for you to work. The range is the next thing we'll take a look at. This is a relatively small space. The scene scale when this was set up is 30 foot by 30 foot US or about 10 meter by 10 meter metric and that is the grid box that runs behind. So as a point of scale, that is important to know as you adjust the values for this bit of lighting. So for the range, I'm going to go ahead and reduce this to the size of the scene. In my case, it'll be 30 feet. It might be 10 meters in yours. I'll put in 30. And then the range fall off. I actually want this to get darker the further away from the bulb it gets, as you would expect in real life. So I'm going to take the range fall off and actually change that all the way to 100%, which means at 30 feet, we're not going to have any light emanating from it at all. We'll leave the fall off rate at linear. And the last two items to adjust right here are the width. Now, specialty shape lights come in with an orientation on the Z axis. You'll notice in the widget that the red is X, green is Y, and blue is Z. Well, in our 3D view here, we can see that the widget for the Z goes up. That means that the ring is going to orbit around that or that torus shape. Now the width of 20 is too large. I want it to be about the same size as this ceiling element right at the top. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to 8 feet or about 1 meter. And you can have it exactly equal by 8. I think in the final file I actually have that set up as 10 meters so it's a little bit oblong. But you can make it a perfect circle by doing equal values in the width and height. Here we choose our ring, ellipse, or rectangle. We'll leave it at ring for the current time. And we'll leave cast shadows. As a final step, though, we're going to change the kind of shadows this casts, though, and make it soft shadows because the light is occurring over a large area. And we just want it to look believably soft. So I'm going to come up to my Effects tab. And instead of enabling, well, I can't enable soft shadows here. 
We'll go to Shadow Buffer, and we'll go ahead and increase the value of this to 512, which will give us some soft shadows. Let's do a quick area render and see how we're doing. I'll click on the Test Render, Keyboard Shortcut X, and drag across our scene. Now we're starting to get a nice blue light that leaves the very center of these spheres dark because it's actually a little bit wider than that and is casting some nice soft shadows in the scene. Let's add our next specialty light here for the energy orbs in the cryo hub area and that's going to be the spark between these two, a special effect light. I'll go ahead and go insert and this time we'll come down to bulb. Now the bulb comes in off-center just a little bit. Let's come back to our Move tool, keyboard shortcut T. I'll click right where I see that and we'll get the widgets to move this around. I'll drag it near the center and drag it up a little bit. In the same way that we scaled the preceding light, I'll do that now and make this smaller and more manageable for our scene by making it 10%. Let's go back to our Generals tab. The first thing we'll want to do is to go ahead and name our light. So we'll leave it at bulb, but we'll say bulb spark. With that done, we want this to be very intense for the effect we're going to add. So I'm going to increase the level of this to about 175 and choose OK. The spark light I also want to be bluish. So I'm going to go ahead and click and just select a pale blue color. The range for this, I want to be quite small. I want it to just be a hot effect right around this area, so I'm going to reduce the range to 10 feet. And for range fall off, I'm going to go ahead and put that at 100%. We'll also leave cast shadows on. We'll come back to our effects tab and go ahead and change again this to a shadow buffer at 512 by 512 pixels. Now the next thing we're going to do is actually add the special effect for that, and it's going to be the light sphere. We're going to click Enable, and then click the Edit button, which gives us a modal dialog box that lets us see exactly what it is we're adjusting. Let's zoom in a little bit closer, and let's actually make this box just a little bit larger so we can see what's going on. I'll grab my magnifying glass, click in here more towards the center, re-render, and I will go ahead and choose Auto Update so I can see these changes as we make them. First thing I want to do is make this very bright. I'm going to increase this to 100%. We can see that it's still white, so what I'll do is change it from its current default to realistic, which gives us a very soft flare on the edge. Quite small, in fact it's too small, so let's bring this radius up to a value of 535. Now we get a larger glowing area. And the quality I also want to boost, so let's bring this up to near 60. Finally, we're going to add a little bit of matter in the atmosphere, so we're going to add some turbulence to this. I'll enable turbulence and increase the scale from a small 1% default to something more like 11%. Now we get a little coarser effect going on right there. You'll notice most of the glow is happening behind this object. That's a cue for us to go ahead and recenter or pull this light a little bit closer to the camera side so we can see what's going on. I'll click OK, highlight bulb spark, and I'm going to choose my tool here. Let me go ahead and collapse this just a little bit. Pull this into our lighting group. It's now underneath, and I want this to come just a little bit closer to the camera. We'll do a quick area render. Now we can see we're getting a nice glow where those two areas are supposed to energize. This gets us ready for step three. For step three here, we're going to add the ring of halogens that goes around this top area. Let's do that now, and we'll do it by adding a spotlight. You can do it from the Insert menu. We'll do it a little bit differently this time by coming over to the Light Icon menu here, and we'll choose the Spotlight icon. Nothing immediately loads into the scene, and when you use the icons over here to make placements, wherever you click in your scene is where the light will appear. So the first little halogen uh, hockey puck that I've got is right here at the top, 
I'll go ahead and click and the light is fairly centered on that but you'll notice it's also resting squarely on the floor. Let me go ahead and grab our widget and drag this up just a little bit higher than that hockey puck light. And just as with the lights we use to illuminate this cryo hub, this is too big. Let's go ahead and change the size of this down to something more like 10%. Come back to our generals palette and like all good 3D artists, let's rename this spot halogen so we can keep track of it. The next thing I want to do is grab this and drag it into our lights folder. It shows up down here at the bottom. Well, let's start dealing with the various settings we want to go ahead and include with this. The settings are common to many of the lights. The first thing we'll want to do is really kick up the intensity of this. So we're going to go to something more like 300. This slider goes all the way up to 2000, which would be just a little bit too bright for us. However, I bring that up because some sliders top out at something like 20 or 40, not necessarily for lights. And you can actually just enter the numeric value higher than what the slider goes. So it's a nice little feature to remember. We want this to be a warmer light, something in the yellow range, yellow orange. And that's because the scene is so blue and so cool that we want a little bit of warmth to be attracting and create a nice dynamic. So I've got kind of a yellow going on there. Maybe I want to make this just a little bit more orange and choose OK. The half angle is the width of this beam right here. It can be interactively clicked and dragged by the little dot so that it more closely matches the size of the hockey puck light here. And that's attractive to me. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this down to a value of something close to 20 actually. You can manually enter actively engage with this light. I like to enter values, personal bias right here. The angular fall off is how crisp the edge of the light is. I want this to have a relatively soft edge where the light gets dimmer the further away it gets from the center called a penumbra. So what we'll do is in the angular fall off I'm going to bring this up to 100 percent. The range of this light I want to be small as well. We'll give this a range of 15 feet or about 1.5 meters. And the reason for that is because when we do our range fall off letting the light become less bright the further away it gets we're going to go ahead and make this fall off to something more like about 40 percent. shadow intensity, we're going to reduce down actually to about 80%. And the reason for this is going to become clear when we go into our next section here. Let's do a quick area render, keyboard shortcut X, and I'll drag through this. We'll see that we don't have any light in the scene, and it's because we need to start engaging some special effects right here. So let's go over to the effects palette, and the first one we're going to do is actually engage soft shadows. Currently they're set as ray traced, and this is going to give us a little bit softer appeal to that. So I'm going to engage this, leave the quality at fast, but increase the level to 0.08 to 0.2. And choose OK. The next area that I will do is come down to the light cone. We're going to enable this, and then we're going to edit it. And it gives us a modal dialog box that pops up that lets us change some of the things we need to be changing. So the first thing we want to do is we can see it in our scene and see that it is way too bright. So let's go ahead and bring this down here, this value to something more like about 15%. If you leave the color of the light cone white, it will pick up the brightness of, or the color of the light. You can have the light cone for special effects be a completely different color if you want, but I want it to imitate the light bulb. So we'll currently leave it as white. I also want this scene to update a little bit as we go to work on it, so I'm going to choose the Auto Update button and make this a little bit larger. Let me hit Render again. There we go. So we can get a better idea of what's going on. Now the light cone is coming through here, but I want it to pick up the shadows of things around it and cast shadows, so we're going to enable 3D shadows. But when I do that, it disappears. And the reason for that is that the light itself is residing behind an object, so it's casting a shadow and getting caught. We're going to invert that with the invert button, so now it shows through, looks like it's emanating from the light above it, and interacts with the objects down below it. I also want to increase the shadow buffer quality a little bit, increasing up to something more like about 155. The last thing I want to do, well I shouldn't say the last thing, an additional thing, is the fall off. You can see how the light cone is very consistent top to bottom. 
So let's change that and increase the fall off to something more like about 40%. And I'll get it up to 38 or so, something like that. And now we can see that cone fading away. So we get this atmospheric sense going on. The last thing I'll want to do is have a little dirt in the air to match some of the glows that we already have going on. So I will enable turbulence, which gives us a fine pattern right now. But I want to actually increase the size of that from 1 to 6. So it'll give us a little coarser pattern. Matter of taste, but that's where we'll leave it right now. With that done, we've got a nice approach here. The next thing we'll want to do is to add a little bit of a light sphere around it so that we get this kind of cast light around the light bulb itself. So the next thing we do is come down to light sphere and engage that. This is the same view that we saw when we worked on the center area. So let's go ahead and adjust these values. Let me do an auto update and render so we can see what's going on. And let's take a look at some of those and see what we need to take a look at. The intensity I want to leave it 50%. The radius, however, I want to make much larger. So we're going to bring this up to about 490. Let's get up here uh, close to 487. We'll leave it at that. Now you'll see we get this really artificial circle around it. I don't want that. So we'll engage realistic. And I will increase the quality of that up to about 50%. Increase in quality always increases render time a little bit. Just be aware of that. Now it's letting us focus only on the effect that we have going on right there. So we're not seeing the actual light cone because we're still working on the same light. So we can isolate this a little bit better. Finally, for turbulence, I'll engage that. Increase this to 6 or a scale of 6 so it's consistent with what's going on. Pretty good. Let's go ahead and accept that. The next step is to duplicate these lights and move them around the scene. I can't see where the hockey puck is above the individual right here, so we're going to come back to our properties palette, go to our station here. I'll expand center since I know that's where it is, and I've got replicator stasis set up. I'm going to highlight that, and then over here in the generals tab, temporarily hide it in the 3D view. And I'll do the same thing for the replicator human. This is going to allow us to hide that just temporarily while we do our thing. Now we can see all of these circles. I'm going to come back to my spot halogen, highlight that, and you can command or control D shortcut to duplicate this light. And all the effects we've got have just been duplicated. It's also found under the edit menu. And that is duplicate right here, so you can look for that. Let me deselect that, and I will choose my Move tool, highlight this, and simply drag this over to the next light. I'll do the rest of the circle off camera, and when we come back, we will go ahead and look at step four. If I click the D again, just so you know, it will duplicate with the same transformation as occurred before. So the light will offset because of that. Great when you're doing something linear, not so much when you're doing an orbit. I'll rejoin with step four. I've completed the halogen lights moving around in a ring, and I actually zoomed in to make it a little bit easier. I've reactivated the stasis chambers and the human replicator, so we have it in place. And then I have grouped all of the halogen lights so that they're easily controllable and nice for us to work with. Let's go ahead and go back to a quad view. I'll back out just a little bit. Let's do a quick area render and see exactly how this is shaping up. Looking pretty nice. The next thing we want to do now for our new step, step four, is to work on the wall wash lights and the ceiling lights, the indirect lights to add a little style and flavor to our scene here. So let's go ahead and come up to our light pull down menu here and select tube light, one of the options we have. You can do it from the insert menu, but this time I want to be clicking it about where I want it to go. Now before I insert this, let's look at something. The wall wash area is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven grid squares. On my scaling system, that's going to be about seven feet. I want the tube light to be somewhat smaller than that, maybe about six. So I'm going to click right here, approximately in the middle. And this comes in. 
And it is important to know that the tube lights actually have the tube itself illuminate along a different axis than the z-axis. Let's back out just a little bit and see what's going on with this. Without adjusting anything, I'm going to go ahead and do an area render. And we'll see nothing because I'm above the ceiling. How about that? Let's try this again. There we go. We can see the light moving along one direction, and that's because the tube lights have the tube itself move along the Y axis a little bit. Let me come up here and select this. So we know the green area for that. Whoops, let me go ahead and highlight our tube light. Green is the Y axis, so we'll keep that in mind as we get ready to make some modifications. I'll drag the tube light up and we'll move that into our light group to make it easier to find and manage. I'm going to, with the light selected here, press R on my keyboard, which activates this rotate tool, just a keyboard shortcut. Move that up, I'll hold the shift key to constrain it so it snaps upright. Move back to my move tool a little bit. And this light, until I get it in place, like with the others, I leave it large. And then after it's about where I want it, I can go ahead and shrink it down a little bit. So that's looking fine. I'm going to come over here to motion. Reduce this from 100% to 10%. So it shrinks up on us a little bit. But now let's come back to the unique settings for this. I want the brightness to be pretty bright because we're going to actually pick a darker color. So 200%, a cool blue for a color. Now let's start working with our range details and see exactly how we want this to work. I will want this to have a smaller range, not particularly large, something more on the order of 5 feet. And for my length itself, remember I counted that off, I want this to be more like 6 feet. Now we'll go ahead and come over to Shadows, and I'm going to engage a shadow buffer, set it to 512. You can also use, by the way, there's one here under Ray Traced Soft Shadows, and we'll engage that on another one I think coming up here, but you can adjust these values. They play a little bit differently, the Soft Shadows and the Shadow Buffer. I won't go into that here. We'll just set this at 512 and call it good. Well, now let's do an area render back in here and see how this is shaping up for us. That's kind of nice, a little bright. I think what we need to do, let me render that again. Notice how we've got a real hard defined area out here. We need to adjust the fall off for that. So let's come back here and select the tube light, make sure it's highlighted, general. And I want the fall off to be 100% neglected to do that. And let's make this blue a little bit darker. That's just a little hot for me. So we'll bring it down here and tone this just a little bit. Do a quick area render. Eh, it's looking better. Tough to see because of that light cone. Ah, eh, that's the look we're we're after. Okay, let's duplicate this. Command D or Control D on the keyboard. Grab my move tool again. Highlight that. Move it along the X axis. We'll group this. Name the group Wall Detail. Or how about something more like um, hmm, Edge Light. That'll work. Make sure we're good. Rotate around here. Do a quick area render. Call me paranoid. I like to double up on that before I start duplicating things. We'll duplicate this group. and we'll move that down into the next wall recess area. As I zoom in a little bit here, center that up like that. And now let's do a render again. Make sure everything's behaving. Yes, rather well. So what I'll do is open, disclose one of these, highlight the tube light, I'm going to duplicate it, but this time I'm going to grab this light out. 
I'm going to drag it till there's a green line over here in the pro uh, properties palette so that I know it's not part of any other group. This is going to be the first of our ceiling reflected lights here. So with this highlighted, I see the black dot over here. I'm going to click and drag this out. Raise this up to just above where these reflectors are that I see here. You can see that a little more closely. Let's zoom in here. And we know currently that the wall wash is running vertically. So I'll press the R key and we will rotate this and constrain this to something more like 90 degrees. And zoom in and make sure that is what's shaping up. I can see it's misplaced. I'll highlight the move tool. Now watch what happens. You'll notice that when I go to the move tool, by George, it looks like the z-axis is still pointing up. When you use the move tool, it moves in perfect perpendicular fashion to these axes in the world space. If you want to see a local space, you can highlight the universal manipulator tool. And this gives you some scale ability and move abilities, but you're able to see it a little more accurately as to how it's actually appearing, or I should say in the local space versus the world space. Come back to this. I'll pull it out here. Let's step back a little bit here and do a quick area render and see how that is pointing. Looking good, except that it's a little short. So let's change this from 6 feet to 22 feet, the length of that reflector. And now we see this edge detail going all the way along. Really nice. OK, well, let's duplicate this light and make life easy on ourselves. Command D, and I'll grab the Move tool or the Object tool here. Move this over to our next one. And I'll just hit uh, Command D again twice. I know I've got two more reflectors. Let's zoom into this top scene just a little bit. We get a bigger space to work with. We'll drag this one all the way over to the other reflector, which I've offset for the purposes of our camera view. I'll highlight this last one and move it to right there. What we can do now is for each of our ceiling edge details is simply drag these two lights into each one of these in sequential order. And they're loaded up and ready to go. Let's come back to our quad view. Do a quick render or area render see how this looks. Pretty nice, we're getting there. Let's go ahead and begin our next step, step five, working on the sled and then we'll be able to finish this off. Well, I'm ready for a quick step five so we can finish this off and start getting into some texturing real quickly and get this thing rendered up. The sled is where we're going to use some other quick little shape lights and it's because it's a cool little hovering anti-gravity sled. So let's come in just a little bit on this. And we're going to come over here to our Light Insert tool. And this time we're going to come down to Shape Light again. And I'm simply going to click underneath the back of it right here. And this drops in like the other shape lights, like a normal light bulb, but the axis is pointing up on it. And what we want to do now is to change this from the ring, which is the default, into the rectangle. Now it's quite a large light at the moment and as we've already learned, let me scroll here a little bit, the light actually emanates out of this black spot. The largeness of the bulb has nothing to do with the emission area, it's simply to give you a visual clue to what's going on. So I'm going to lower that black spot underneath our sled and let's reduce the size of this. I'll bring it down to our standard 10%. So it's a little bit smaller and easier to work with as we go ahead and get that handled. Now we've been putting everything in the lights category, which is all well and good, but the chances of us moving the sled around for composition is pretty high. So what I want to do is actually attach this light to the sled. I'm going to come down and disclose the sled group. Let's rename this shape light to, come back over here, Let's give it something like a uh, shape light sled. 
and then we've got our areas that we can start adjusting here for that. I'm going to drag this light and make it part of a group, a child of the sled, and let's change its properties. We want a nice uh, science fiction green here, so something more like this. The brightness, this is not to be the hero of the scene. It's to be you know, less bright than the stasis chambers and everything. So let's reduce this down to something more like about 50%. I'll round that off specifically. The range for this, quite small, three feet. Don't want it to illuminate very much at all. Now the width coming in is quite large. I'm going to change this to 2.5 feet in my case and one foot on the other. So it comes in as a square. I'm making it a little bit more of a rectangle so that it shows up differently for us. Let me come into our scene a little bit here and orbit around this and get a better idea of how this is presenting. Let's do a quick area render. It's misaligned with the sled, so I'm going to want to rotate that a little bit. So We'll take note of the x-axis here. I want that to run along longitudinally to this. So I will highlight the Rotate tool. And we'll just turn this till it's an approximate amount. We could actually go capture the information from the slit if we wanted and enter that in. But hey, I don't have that much patience today. So we'll do that. That's in place. Actually, I think I want it to rotate 90 degrees. I want it to be wide instead of long here. So let's come in and make a quick change. Use the Universal Manipulator tool to see that. And we'll get that lined up like so. There, much better. I'll highlight this light over in the Properties panel and duplicate it. And this is a case where, let me show you the difference between the World Space and Local Tools. If I highlight this light now, the local tool, we'll see that we, if we grab the widget that is, we can only move it perfectly along the X, Y, and Z world coordinates. I'm interested in moving it somewhere else. So we're going to use the universal manipulator and now I can drag it along its local coordinates and it shows up like that. So when we come back and do an area render, now we're getting some nice light showing up underneath the sled. I might even want to space that out a little bit further or move one back. If I grab the original one, select our manipulator tool, move that a little further back. Looks good. The last thing I want to do is add a red light for a warning panel right over here by our cryo station here. So let me go ahead and move around our scene just a little bit. I will insert a bulb. And that came in on the far side. I probably, honestly, should have just gone ahead and grabbed one and placed it into the scene. But it's easy to handle. So let's come in and orbit around our scene a little bit. I want this to sit right on top of the control panel. So I'm going to change this, or actually grab the center, which allows me to move it on the X, Y axis, raise this up a little bit, and of course that's too large. Back to our standard 10%. I think you're getting the idea of that now. And while there's a texture map that goes ahead and creates the redness of the control panel or the, the button on the control panel, we want this to glow out a little bit more. Fuss with that just a little bit. Okay, well, let's go ahead and turn this to a nice red color. I'll give this a very narrow field here. Brightness, will leave that at about 100%. And let's pick a nice hot red. Range fall off 100%. Give this a range something really small, like two feet. And shadow intensity will leave at 100%. Let's do a quick area render and see how this is looking. Nice, nice little glow for that. 
So we'll leave it at that. If we do a quick render like this, we'll see that we're starting to get some nice effects going on. I'd say these wall washes are a little bit hot, um, and certainly those can be adjusted. They're being added to a little bit by the light cone that's brightening them up a little bit. So let me show you how we change multiple lights at one time. Let's come back to, and they are looking bright, I think, because we don't have a texture on the wall, but I'll show you how to change that real quickly just so you can get an idea of that. I'll collapse the sled. We'll come up to lights. Now remember how we group those into two edge light groups? I'm just going to highlight those groups. And we can come over to a little tool here under the Edit menu. And we'll come down to Master Light. This gives you the ability to change values of any bulbs you have selected, since those are children of the master objects there. Um, we're selecting them, but if we had different kinds of lights, we could uniquely grab them and change them according to this. And we can also change it as a basis of percentage of current value. So right now I'm going to leave everything as it is because we're going to start adding textures and I know those values will work well for us. But it's easy to come into and change shadow intensity, brightness, color for a multitude of lights real easily. I'll click Cancel. Let's get some shaders in here and get to work. With this highlighted here in the area, I will go ahead and let's expand that to a single view. And we need to get some shaders. The finished project has them all, but they're also loaded into a separate folder. So let's look how we can add a folder to our shader area. I'm going to come over to the Shaders tab so that it's highlighted. I will come to the File menu, Add Folder. And this shows up to my desktop, but I know that there are some C7 shaders for this project co-located with it in the folder. So you can grab that, select OK. Just choose, we want this in the shaders area. It appears down at the very bottom. And so now all the shaders that are used in the scene are actually available. So for example, these little bins on top of our hovering sled, we can simply come down and grab, move this up just a little bit, base white. And if you want to know which shaders go exactly where, you can open the final file, you can examine them specifically, but adding them is very easy, just dragging and dropping. So now when we do a quick area render, we can see this starting to show up pretty well. The last step would be to go ahead and pop on over to our render room and re-engage the indirect light and render things out. So I'll let you texture and modify that on your time, but we've got our scene pretty well set up now and it's starting to look pretty good. The brightness of the wall will come down as the texture is added to that, so I don't think these are too bright for that, but I'll let you be the decision or the judge of that. Thanks for spending some time with me in this tutorial. That's how you can start beginning lighting some really cool scenes in Carrera with Carrera 7 Standard.